Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, and welcome to the reading of lesson number three in this series on the book of John, written by E. Edward Zinke and Thomas R. Shepard. This lesson is titled The Backstory, The Prologue, and is ready for teaching on October 19. I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 12. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for this beautiful gospel of John that tells us so much about Jesus. And this week we look at a very important part, the backstory, the prologue of this particular book, where we find that Jesus is just so important for each of us. And as we open your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us and that our needs will be satisfied in relation to our walk with you in our personal lives. Lord, today I'd particularly like to pray for Vanessa, uh, sister of Andronica. Uh, She has a special need, Lord, and I pray you'll be with her. And then for in Guyana and Barbados, the Blair, Yours and Ames families, and Rachel Alexis of Orlando, Florida. Lord, you know her needs and her grandchildren's needs as well. And Doreen Hines and her mother in the Cayman Islands. Lord, there are people all over the world who are listening to this podcast of the lesson who need you, and we pray that whatever their needs are, that they may turn their hearts to you and that your Spirit will work in their lives. Lord, as we open your word, may we see Jesus, I pray in his dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And reading the memory verse for the second time for this week is a member of my church, Steve Petman. Thank you, Steve. My name's Steve. I'm from the Landsborough Church. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 1. Week 1 dealt with the end of the book of John, which explained why he wrote his Gospel. This week's lesson returns to the beginning of the Gospel, where John sets forth the direction that he, inspired by the Holy Spirit, intends to take the reader. In the first words and paragraphs of their writing, New Testament writers often present the themes that they intend to cover. So does John, whose themes are presented as part of a grand cosmic sweep that depicts overriding truths about Jesus Christ, truths that reach back to even before creation. This presentation at the opening of the book gives readers who already know that Jesus is the Messiah an advantage that the characters in the book itself do not have. The reader can clearly see the grand themes that the evangelist returns to as he tells the story of Jesus. These great themes are placed within the historical period of Jesus' earthly life. This week's lesson will begin with the prologue of John 1, verses 1 to 18, and summarize its major themes. These themes will then be looked at in other places in John's Gospel as well. Sunday, October 13, In the Beginning, the Divine Logos. Read John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. What do these words reveal about the Word, Jesus Christ? John 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Gospel of John begins with this amazing thought. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 verse 1. This one beautiful sentence contains a depth of thought that we can barely grasp. 
First, the evangelist alludes to the creation story in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning. The word was already there before the beginning of the universe. Thus, John affirms Jesus' eternal existence. Next, and the word was with God. In John 1.18, John indicates that he is in the bosom of the Father, and we'll come to that later in the lesson. No matter how we may try to envision what this exactly means, one thing is sure. Jesus and the Father are intimately close. And then he says, And the Word was God. But how can the Word be with God and at the same time be God? The answer is found in the Greek. Greek has a definite article, the, but no indefinite article, a or an. What's important for us then is that the Greek definite article, the, points to particularity, some particular object or person. In the phrase, the word was with God, the term God has the definite article, thus pointing to a particular individual, the Father. And the word was with the Father. In the phrase, and the word was God, the term God does not have the article which in this setting points to the characteristics of divinity. Jesus is God, not the Father, but he is still the divine Son of God, the second person of the Godhead. The Apostle verifies this understanding, for John 1 verses 3 and 4 says that Jesus is the creator of all things created. Anything that once didn't exist but then came into existence, did so only through Jesus, the Creator God. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 19, From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of His greatness and majesty, the outshining of His glory. And so to finish the day, Why is the full deity of Christ such an important part of our theology? What would we lose if Jesus were in any other way a mere created being? Bring your answer to class on Sabbath and be prepared to discuss why Christ's eternal deity is so important to our faith. Monday, October 14, The Word Made Flesh Read John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 and verse 14. What are these verses telling us that Jesus, God himself, did? And why is this truth the most important truth that we could ever know? Let's begin. John chapter 1 at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. And verse 14, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John starts his gospel not with the name Jesus or his role as Messiah or Christ, but with the term Logos. Around the time John wrote, various philosophies used the term Logos to refer to the rational structure of the universe or to refer to the idea of logic and reason themselves. Also, the teaching of the influential ancient philosopher Plato had divided reality into two realms. One is the heavenly and immutable realm, where absolute perfection exists. The other is the realm here, perishable, changing, a very imperfect representation of the perfect realm above, wherever it supposedly existed. Plato never answered that question. 
Some philosophies identified the Logos as some abstract intermediary between the eternal forms and the perishable, earthly forms here. John uses the term in a completely different manner. He maintains that the truth, the Logos, is not some ethereal and abstract concept floating between heaven and earth. The Logos is a person, Jesus Christ, who became flesh and dwelt among us. As we read in John 1.14, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. For John, the Logos is the Word of God. More important, God communicated, that is, he revealed himself to humanity in the most radical way. God became one of us. In the Gospel of John, the Logos represents the eternal God who enters time and space, who speaks, acts, and interrelates with humans on a personal level. The eternal God became a human being, one of us. In John 1.14, the Apostle indicates that the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. The underlying Greek word translated dwelt meant to pitch a tent. John is alluding to Exodus 25 verse 8, where God told the Israelites to make a sanctuary, a tent structure, so that he could dwell in their midst. Exodus 25 verse 8 reads, Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. In the same way, in the Incarnation, Jesus, the divine Son of God, stepped into human flesh, veiling his glory so that people could come in contact with him. And so to finish the day, dwell on the implications of what John has written here. God himself, the Creator, became a human being, one of us, and lived here among us. We haven't even gotten to his dying for us yet. What does this tell us about the reality of God's love for humanity? Why should we draw so much comfort from this amazing truth? Tuesday, October 15. Hearing or not hearing the word. Read John chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. What harsh reality is John depicting here about how people respond to Jesus? John chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The prologue, John 1, verses 1 to 18, describes not only who Jesus Christ, the Word, Logos, is, but also how people in the world related to him. In John 1 verse 9, he is called the true light who enlightens every person coming into the world. That light illumines the world, making it understandable. As C.S. Lewis puts it, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And that's from Is Theology Poetry, page 15. Also, look at the implications of what John 1.9 is saying. Light comes to everyone. Not everyone welcomes the light. As we see in tomorrow's study, a major theme in the Gospel of John is how people receive or reject Jesus. That theme begins here. The sad litany is that the Messiah came to his people, his own people, the people of Israel, and many did not receive him as the Messiah. 
In Romans 9 and 10 and 11, Paul deals with the same tragic theme of many Jews rejecting Jesus. But Paul doesn't end on a negative note saying, in fact, that many Jews, along with Gentiles, will accept Jesus as their Messiah. Indeed, he warns the Gentiles not to boast against the Jews, for, as he says in Romans 11.24, if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? In a similar vein, John says that all who do receive Jesus as their Saviour will become the children of God. This happens by believing on his name, as you read in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Here is the connection between the prologue and the conclusion of the gospel. In John 20, verse 31, the Apostle presents why he wrote, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life by his name. Thus, the introduction and the conclusion form a kind of unity. They are related concepts that enclose all that occurs between them. This linkage points to the overarching goal of the Gospel of John, that people will be saved by believing on Jesus Christ as their Saviour. And so to finish today, how has your life changed by becoming a son or a daughter of God? Wednesday, October 16. Reappearing themes, belief, unbelief. Read John chapter 3, verses 16 to 21, chapter 9, verses 35 to 41, and chapter 12, verses 36 to 46. How do the texts repeat the theme of belief, unbelief, found in the prologue? First of all, we read John chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And chapter 9, beginning at verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. When he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? the man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And chapter 12, beginning at verse 36. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. 
This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so that they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet, at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Then Jesus cried out, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. In John's Gospel, humanity seems to be divided into two overarching groups, those who believe in Jesus and accept him as the Messiah, and those who, having the opportunity to believe, choose not to. Eleven of the disciples are in the first group, as are others such as Nicodemus, who comes to faith slowly, the woman at the well, and the man born blind. In the second group are Pharisees and high priests, people at the miracle of feeding the five thousand, and even one of the disciples, Judas. It is interesting that the noun pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, Greek for faith or belief, never appears in the Gospel of John. However, the verb pisteo, P-I-S-T-E-U-O, believe, appears 98 times, compared to 241 times total in the entire New Testament. This verb is indeed a very big theme in John. This use of the verb instead of the noun may point to a very active sense of becoming a Christian. Being a believer in Jesus is something that we do, and this is expressed in how we live and not just in a set of beliefs. As we know, the devil believes in Jesus as well, as we read in James 2.19. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that, and shudder. In John, the major difference between the two groups is the way that they relate to Jesus. Believers, or those who come to believe, have an openness toward him, even when he confronts or rebukes them. They come to Jesus and do not run away. He is the light that shines on them, and by faith, by believing, they become the children of God. Unbelievers, on the other hand, typically come to Jesus to fight with him. They are characterized by those who love darkness rather than light. They find his sayings hard to accept, or they see him breaking old traditions and not fulfilling their expectations. They stand in judgment on him rather than letting his light measure and judge them. This attitude, of course, has been seen again and again in the religious leaders who ideally, as the spiritual guides of the nation, should have been the first ones to have accepted Jesus. And so to finish today, in what ways do you live out your faith in Jesus as opposed to merely holding an intellectual assent to him as the Messiah? Why is it important to know the difference? Let's look at Matthew seven twenty one to 23 Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Thursday, October 17, Reappearing Themes, Glory 
Read John chapter 17, verses 1 to 5. What did Jesus mean when he said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. John 17, beginning at verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Yesterday's study looked at the earthly human storyline of the Gospel of John, with its clash and interplay between people, always revolving around who Jesus is and what he is doing. Today's study focuses on the divine cosmic storyline, also found in John. The prologue begins with that cosmic storyline. Jesus is presented as the divine Son of God, the creator of the universe. Again, anything that once didn't exist but came into existence did so only through Jesus. As we read in John 1.3, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. But it goes on to note the glory of his becoming a human being in the Incarnation, in verse 14 of chapter 1. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John uses the terms glory or doxa, D-O-X-S-A, which means brightness, splendor, fame or honor, and glorify, which is doxazo, D-O-X-S-A-Z-O, which means to praise, honor, extol and glorify, to speak both of receiving honor from humans and of receiving honor or glory from God. In John, the idea of glorifying Jesus is linked to the concept of his hour, that is, the time of his death. And here we'll compare several passages of Scripture. First of all, John 2, verse 4, Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. And then John 7, verse 30, At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. And John chapter 8, and verse 20, He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him, because his hour had not yet come. And then John 12, verses 23 to 27, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies... It remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. And John 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And John 16, verse 32. A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. And John 17, verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. 
The cross is his hour of glory. This idea is quite paradoxical because crucifixion was the most shameful and humiliating way of execution in the ancient Roman world. This incredible contrast, God on a cross, illustrates the intertwining of the human story plot with the divine. On the human level, Jesus died in agony, a despised criminal in weakness crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This human dark side of the cross is particularly presented in Matthew and Mark. Matthew records it in chapter 27, verse 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in Mark 15, 34, we read, And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the glorious side of the cross is especially presented in Luke and John. Luke records in chapter 23, verses 32 to 47, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him, which read, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. And John chapter 19, beginning at verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is a place of salvation, of mercy, and where the Son of God gives himself to the Father. How ironic! God's greatest glory is revealed in his greatest shame, bearing the sins of the world in himself. And so to finish today, think about what it means that it took such a drastic thing, God himself on the cross, to save us from sin. 
What should this tell us about just how bad sin really is? Friday, October 18, Further Thought From the Ellen G. White Comments of the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1126, we read, The Lord Jesus Christ, the Divine Son of God, existed from eternity, a distinct person, yet one with the Father. He was the surpassing glory of heaven. He was the commander of the heavenly intelligences and the adoring homage of the angels was received by him as his right. This was no robbery of God. And here Proverbs 8 verses 22 to 27 is quoted. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. I was formed long ages ago, at the very beginning when the world came to be, when there were no watery depths, I was given birth, when there were no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth, before he made the world or its fields or any of the dust of the earth. I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep. The quote continues, There are light and glory in the truth that Christ was one with the Father before the foundation of the world was laid. This is the light shining in a dark place, making it resplendent with divine original glory. This truth, infinitely mysterious in itself, explains other mysterious and otherwise unexplainable truths, while it is enshrined in light unapproachable and incomprehensible. End of quote. And then from the same author, from the book Steps to Christ, pages 26 and 27, Jesus has said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, John 12.32. Christ must be revealed to the sinner as the Saviour dying for the sins of the world. And, as we behold the Lamb of God upon the cross of Calvary, the mystery of redemption begins to unfold to our minds, and the goodness of God leads us to repentance. In dying for sinners, Christ manifested a love that is incomprehensible. And as the sinner beholds this love, it softens the heart, impresses the mind, and inspires contrition in the soul. Whenever they, that's people, make an effort to reform from a sincere desire to do right, it is the power of Christ that is drawing them. An influence of which they are unconscious works upon the soul, and the conscience is quickened, and the outward life is amended. And as Christ draws them to look upon his cross, to behold him whom their sins have pierced, the commandment comes home to the conscience. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, why would John start out talking about Jesus in his role as creator? Why does this tell us about the importance of creation in all theology? Why then is it important that we have a correct understanding of creation as revealed in Scripture? And question two, dwell more on the question asked at the end of Sunday's study. What happens to the cross if, instead of the eternal God dying on it, a created being did? What do we lose if Jesus were anything but the eternal God? And reading our inside story, our mission story for this week is Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. A Sabbath Sea by Andrew McChesney. A Native American man walked onto the construction site. What are you guys building here? he asked, watching volunteers place log walls on the concrete foundation of, all, of the All Nations Center in Wapato, a town in the U.S. state of Washington. Another church, he said, shaking his head. You guys don't even know what day of the week to keep. A construction leader, Jeff Wei John, struck up a conversation with the man who had never heard of Seventh-day Adventists. The man thought that the new church would be open for worship on Sunday, 
but he believed that the Creator should be worshipped on Saturday. Jeff was surprised. It was the first time that I had heard that some Native Americans have a history of Sabbath keeping, Jeff said in an interview. Later, Jeff sought clarification from a historian familiar with Native American history. The historian confirmed that one or two tribes on the Yakamana Indian Reservation, where Wapato is located, traditionally believed that the seventh day was the Creator's day and worshipped him on that day. The realisation that God had planted a Sabbath seed in Native hearts energised Jeff and his wife, Terry, in mission outreach to Native Americans. The outreach program got its start with the help of a 13th Sabbath offering in 1990. A highlight of the program is the All Nations Centre which opened in 2001 and was designed as a multi-purpose building. It has a worship corner where people gather to worship on Sabbath mornings, a food area where meals are served and an annual Mother's Day brunch draws three to 400 people, and volleyball and basketball courts where up to 200 children and their parents come for game nights. The centre also offers day camps, vacation Bible schools and an after-school tutoring service. Native Americans and others can lease space. One reason we built the facility was because the community had nowhere to meet, Jeff said. In a notable instance, a Native American leader chose the site over a Native-owned casino to conduct health seminars saying gambling was destroying his people. It was quite a testimony that he didn't want anything to do with the casino, Jeff said. The centre's culturally sensitive concept has proven so successful that it has been replicated elsewhere, including in Canada, he said. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath School offerings that continue to make a difference. Pray that God uses them to proclaim the everlasting gospel to every tribe, tongue, people and nation.